Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of all ages and all seasons of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. We welcome people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientations, and gender identities, social and economic situations, abilities, and politics. We are advocates for human rights, and we strive to be good stewards of this one earth. And in living that mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part. We take a moment as we gather in service every Sunday to recognize that this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. And so we take a moment in service, as we have been asked to do, to honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank folks for joining us in person and online. Uh, we recognize how precious it is to gather, to expand our circles of care, to expand our capacity for kindness and compassion. So if you are new, please help us get to know you. We have plenty of name tags. We love all the questions. Ooh, I'm going to talk more about questions in just a minute. And I want to invite folks to stay uh, after the service for coffee in Fellowship Hall. Patio is also a good option as well. Or stay and visit on Zoom, too. And now, as we are gathering, I want to take, have folks pause and take a moment to see what your status, your personal devices are. Are they in worship mode? Just think about it. Well, no, maybe actually check. That's also good, too. Whether silent or vibrate, we also recognize that some folks have medical assistance uh, with their devices, and sometimes those set sound needs to be left on. So we just understand that's also the case as well. I want to say a note or two about uh, today's service. One, this is the question box sermon. So if you are new to our congregation, this is a moment. Uh, I invite folks to take the little piece of paper I hope you received with your order of service. And if you need uh, another one, if you need more, we have plenty. Please go ask an usher uh, and write a question. Those questions will be collected during the offering. And those questions I'll be, I will receive those. And that is what I'm going to use for the basis of my sermon today. I'm going to be answering as many of those questions as reasonably possible, with a teeny bit of depth at least. Um, and whatever questions I don't get to, uh, those will be also saved. The whole part of the whole point of this is that I get to see a little bit about what's on your mind and in your heart as we begin the church year, as we're getting ready to start the church year next month. And this gives me a little bit of insight, a little help with the worship planning as well. Uh, and all the questions are welcome from all the people. So all ages are welcome to ask a question, too. And we have a couple of notes for after service today. We have two meetings. One, uh, there'll be a conversation about music and the choir in the conference room with me. We have to kind of do a little rethinking and planning, and I would love to hear that conversation from you. And also, uh, back in the kind of bar room in the RE wing, uh, stewardship We'll be gathering to talk about some of the fundraising and some of the other uh, financial, how to do well with income and also investment in the congregation. So you want to see Nancy Rakoff for that. Uh, next Saturday, we have a couple of great things coming up. Next Saturday is the uh, live action role playing day. And there's a bunch of different uh, activities to sign up for, windows of games to sign up for. I want to recommend folks see Jesse Lachlan uh, about that. But please get like a few people to hang out with you and sign up for a time to do the game. It takes about an hour and a half or so. Um, so it's a good opportunity to do that. Next Sunday is uh, part of our, uh, the theme I'm talking about is democracy. Uh, seems fitting for Labor Day weekend. And after the service will be one of our first kind of get out the vote kinds of efforts with Do You the Vote? I'm going to direct you to Regina Stanley 
for that. And last little bit here. In two weeks, two Sundays, is our in-gathering water communion, this official start of our church year on September 8th. Uh, so I invite you to bring a little bit of water from your summer journeys, however near or far. Uh, from the back garden is great as well. And we'll bring that water together and kind of reconnect as a symbol of our shared community. All are welcome and encouraged to participate. We'll also have a little bit of a potluck lunch and some splash and water uh, games after the service. So we'll have a good time. All right. And now let me invite you to join me in continuing to worship with our opening hymn number 126, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Please rise in body or spirit. Holly Green forward for our opening. The Longing for Something More by Reverend Gretchen Haley. Every little thing that breaks your heart is welcome here. We'll make a space for it, give it its due time and praise for the wanting it represents, for the longing for something more, some healing hope that remains. Not yet. We promise no magic, no making it all better, but offer only this circle of trust, this human community that remembers, though imperfectly, that sings and prays, though sometimes awkwardly, this gathering that loves, though not yet enough, we're still practicing. After all, still learning, still in need of help and partners, still becoming able to receive all this beauty and all these gifts we each bring. Come, let us worship together. And I invite Kathy McNeil forward for our chalice lighting. Our, excuse me, <clears throat> Our Welcome to Share by Anastasi Virat. 
We light this chalice, are welcome to share, and our communion to declare. May this flame shine bright and afar to serve as our community's load star. All are welcome from everywhere. Unitarian Universalist Minister Heather Christensen has written that Unitarian Universalism is a grand vision of a world filled with peace and love and justice and joy. And that vision is embodied in a few large congregations, numerous mid-sized congregations like ours, many, many small congregations, and many teeny congregations as well. And no matter the size, every congregation depends on the generosity of its members, every one of them. Every one of us depends on each other. So each one of us, in our time and our energy and our resources, helps make that vision and that shared effort real. So I want to invite us into a moment of generosity, of intentional giving, of spiritual practice. So we'll receive the offering in this moment. And part of what we also do in that practice is a share the plate that we share some of our abundance with our local community. In this case, for the month of August, it's Hope Renewed Youth Conference and how they provide support for candidates in the professions of teaching and law enforcement, especially for those who will stay in the community and pursue those professions. So we take about uh, half of the undesignated uh, donations every Sunday, and uh, one half is for the church, one is for our recipient. And I so appreciate everybody's generosity with these. We've really been able to make some good gifts into the world. And this is also a moment after we've passed the plates, um, and I light the candles where folks are welcome to come up during the music and light a candle before us. It might be for something in your mind, on your heart, that needs just a little flash, a little spark to honor and to make real. So I invite the ushers to please come forward. the questions in that time. You can pass along some questions closer to the sermon as well, but if you've already got a question down, this is a good moment too. Thank you. Okay.
spirit of community in which we share and find strength and common purpose. We turn our mind and hearts toward one another, seeking to bring into our circle of concern all who need our love and support, those who are ill, those who are in pain in body or spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. We bring into our circle of care all who know joy, celebration, new wonderful things coming, for they might need a little care and support too. We offer for this moment a note about Sherry and Bob Dearborn and their family that our thoughts and prayers are with the Dearborn family as Sherry suffered a stroke while visiting their daughter in Colorado. And this has been compounded by a shoulder injury. So this is a moment when maybe the best way to show care at this time is to send text messages to Bob. Um, they there's not an obvious address for sending notes because they keep moving to different facilities and different places to stay. And you may not be able to receive calls because of being around certain medical equipment, but they also know that we have been extending their care. They've been receiving our messages and they know they are held. We all wish Sherry a smooth recovery. We look forward to seeing them again. I invite us to take one more moment, one more moment of quiet for all the joys and the sorrows, the names and the milestones that are among us that may or may not be ever spoken, but are with us still. Let us take one more moment and breathe. We are grateful for the moment, for the miracle of consciousness we share, the consciousness that gives us the power to remember, to love, and to care. Amen, namaste, and blessed be. So I want to invite Amy Crudonaway forward to offer the story for today. And if you still need just a moment to write out some questions, this is a good moment too. The Girl with the Big Questions by Brittany Wynn-Lean, illustrated by Jacob Suova. So move this one. Okay. There once was a girl with twinkling eyes and a very curious mind. This girl was always asking questions whose answers weren't easy to find. The world is so very interesting. She wanted to learn all she could. From what makes a plane stay in the sky to what makes each person good. Her days were filled with adventure galore, since her mind was so full of wonder. How long can a turtle stay in its shell? Why does lightning come before thunder? Why can't people live on the moon? What happens to stars when they fall? When will you let me stay up all night? Why even have a bedtime at all?
What does the dog do while I'm at school? Hey, how is the whole world made? And why do we have big hearts that can feel hurt and upset and afraid? Could I fly if I got a good running start? The nearest volcano is where? Are monsters real? What's Spanish for blue? Is it okay to cut my own hair? Isaac, that page reminds me of you. Flying and hair cutting and volcano, that might be you. From the moment she opened her eyes for the day, the time she was tucked into bed, she'd ask and ask and ask and ask every question that popped into her head. At first, her neighbors, teachers, and friends tried to answer her wonder-filled mind. But after a while, their encouraging smiles were replaced by the rolling of eyes. She noticed her questions were making them tense, and one day her class hit their limit. After she'd asked a dozen things about clouds, the class hollered, Please stop! Just quit it. Embarrassed, the girl tried to quiet her thoughts and not raise a voice so curious so that no one would be too uncomfortable or even worse, furious. But one day she found the nest of a bird built low and exposed near the ground. Why would a nest not be in a tree? She wondered and then looked around. She was all by herself with no one to ask, so she ran to the library shelves. She read about cities and the lack of safe places for birds to build nests for themselves. Like hunting for treasure, she searched and learned more answers that made her frown. With an urgent report, she announced to her class, there's not enough trees in our town. The class, now moved by this information, asked questions about how to embark on a project to help both the birds and the neighbors by planting more trees in their parks. The girl knew then that big questions are good and answers aren't just things to know. They are things to discover alongside each other. Asking questions is how we all grow. I think there's one more page, the last. Oh, there's not. It says, I wonder, what questions do you have and where will you find your answers? I know Reverend Jennifer has a few answers, but I'm sure she's going to ask a few questions back if I know her. (laughs) Thank you. And now I invite our children and youth, welcome to... Go back to the uh, religious education wing. You could stay in for the questions as well. That's always an adventure. Um, But I just wanted to offer that we have that. We have a little bit of a program for the children and youth. So if you'd like to enjoy that, you may do so. Now I invite you to sing with me. Go now in peace.
So this particular morning, the sermon is one that we create together. I have a number of questions from you, and if you still have a question or two out there that didn't quite get written down, you're welcome to come and toss it up here for in the moment. And I will do my best within time and ability to respond, and any question not addressed will help inform worship for the coming year. Um, and perhaps the conversation often intends, often tends to add to the questions from a whole, thank you. I'm like, I know there's more. I know we had the offering a little bit early in the service, so all right, thank you, thank you. We have some more? Great. Like, I'm up for it. No, really. All the questions. All right, so now you may wonder why is Reverend Jennifer looking to us for our questions? Doesn't she have plenty of things to talk about all on her own? Is this her way of getting out of writing a sermon? Well, the answer to the second question is, uh, yes, I have plenty. I have, well, this, doesn't she have plenty of things to talk about? Is there a way to get So, okay, at least the first question is actually also yes, because there, we have really only begun to explore the larger message of progression and progressive religion in this time and space. We've really only just begun. No matter how many times we have that Easter comes around again and Christmas comes around again and the, the new start to the church year comes around again, you would think we've run out of things to do and say. But no, we've only just begun. Now, but I also want to offer that, does it let me off the hook? No. Because to show up and answer the kinds of questions I know you have, and I've already seen some, in no way lets me off the hook, in no way lets a minister off the hook at all. Because I really do mean that we invite all the questions. And add to that that I'm trying to do this in the context of worship and need to remain so, whatever is asked of me, I will just offer, this is both fun and very serious business all at once. It is good work as we offer in Montessori practice. And let me also offer why ministers receive questions from congregations. Because our congregations choose who will preach and who will lead worship. And once chosen, the minister may say what they want to say say as they see it, see fit. This, is, this liberty is part of our free pulpit tradition, and we take it very seriously. We take it to heart. And at the same time, part of the trust placed in the preaching minister is that we speak to the lives of the congregation and to our larger faith as a whole and to our larger societal context as well. So to do this, to fulfill that obligation without ever asking, what are your concerns? To me, I would not be doing my job. And it keeps me from a wonderful source of information and inspiration. And asking for your questions, I feel like, is part of our covenant, part of our commitment in relationship together. By yes, we get more. See, I mean it. So, again, I will answer as many as I can in the usual general window of the sermon time, and the rest will help inform our time together. I actually do keep them every year. I do. Okay. Now, let's see. Now, I actually have to look at the ones that were just handed to me. Thank you for being legible in your handwriting as well. It makes it enormously more feasible. Ah, here we go. I'm like, I know there's got to be an election question in here someplace. Ah. Boy. All right. All right. Now let's see where we begin. And I will also say that sometimes I will not answer a question simply because I really would need to think about it more deeply to answer it properly. So I just call that as well.
Now, let me begin just with a little bit of a warming up that the stole that I am wearing, this is part of how I understand uh, the mark of taking on the obligations and responsibilities and joys of ministry, is wearing a stole such as this. It helps to mark sacred time, if you will. And if you are someone who knows science fiction, if you are someone, in fact, who knows classic Doctor Who, then I love Doctor Who because he, he expands all the questions and adventures out into all of time and space. And this is the pattern of the scarf from the fourth Doctor Tom Baker in the classic Doctor Who. Go look that up. Right. Um, let's see. So let me start with a practical question to kind of get warmed up as well. When will small groups be starting up anytime soon? The answer is yes. We do, we have a covenant circle uh, kind of ministry, the formal small group um, ministry in this congregation. And if you look into the September newsletter, you'll see a little bit of, you'll see an invitation for that. We kind of refresh and renew those uh, every year. The groups kind of take a little bit of a hiatus or a little change of pace and structure over the summer, but they come back together in September and October. So I really want to invite folks to be part, to let, ask questions about our small group ministry or small group opportunities. Um, and you're welcome to come to me uh, to do so. Uh, and you'll see in the November, the September newsletter, and we'll formally start things up uh, with kind of new configurations of groups in October. So by all means, thank you for asking. And yes, yes, the small groups will be coming back very soon. All right. All right, I think I just need to answer this one. Will I be a potato in my next life? Will I be a potato in my next life? You know, it is a theological question. And there's a little potato illustration, too, so I think that's why I have to also, you know, give me an image and I also have to answer. Um, so, I'm going to say in the larger Unitarian Universalism, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, that's part of the whole point uh, in our conversations about uh, theology and what happens after we die is we are, as a collective, we are deeply agnostic. We just don't know, which is partially why we spend so much time saying we know how we know we have this moment together and we're really going to focus on this moment together. That said, we do, and this kind of maybe touches on a little bit of a, another question, we do recognize inspiration and truths found in many different traditions, in poetry, in nature, in science, and words and deeds of so many people. So we draw from traditions that might say, yes, you just might be a potato in your next life. And we kind of recognize that, and no surprise, probably answer, ask a lot of questions about that, but also recognize that Life continues, and we don't know what that looks like as we, those of us who understand um, the spirit or the soul as energy that never dissipates, what does that look like after this particular body passes? We don't know. And isn't it interesting to think about what might happen and how we might, I think also this question goes to how do we have an impact uh, on the world? What is our legacy? What is our obligation? I don't know, do you think a potato is a higher form of life than us? That's a good conversation, right? So I think this is one of those moments when we are willing to kind of ask the questions and kind of wonder where those conversations take us and what we discover along the way. So potato, maybe, really good French fries, I don't know. But might we also grow into potato and add to the wholeness and the healing of the world by being a beautiful plant that 
processes oxygen and carbon and so on and so forth. That's an idea too. Right. So I do want to get to the question that I was thinking of with this one, which is, if you accept all faiths, but don't prioritize any, how do you provide spiritual nourishment? I'm going to read this one again. If you accept all faiths, but don't prioritize any, how do you provide spiritual nourishment? So, I think we do a lot to show that we draw from lots of different traditions. I mean, our sanctuary reflects that with these banners alone, right? And if you look in our two hymnals, you will see they are organized by sources as well, Christian and Jewish, uh, transcendent meaning, and so on. And I also want to offer that what we're operating from is specifically Unitarian Universalist. That is our structure. That is where we're coming from, which has certain assumptions in terms of theology. We assume the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We assume that we are deeply interconnected. We assume that revelation is open, that there is always something new to learn. We assume that each person has a voice and a vote and agency over their mind, body, and spirit, and that we do better when we organize together. And that we have a certain, we must freely gather of no uh, coercion for the sake of justice for the sake of a better society. We operate under those kinds of presumptions. And then we also add on the layer of being of drawing from many sources. So the spiritual nourishment can look like Buddhist meditation, can look like going and sitting in the woods, walking the woods adjacent to the congregation which I think is one of our deepest sources of spiritual nourishment that we have simply right here, well chosen by the congregation way back when they chose this location for this place and this building. We can also have conversations about, uh, we provide spiritual nourishment any given Sunday. We provide it when we have Easter. We provide it when we have, uh, when we have Christmas when we do a service of remembrance later in October to talk about grief and to hold that in all its complexity, every day we provide spiritual nourishment within the container of a Unitarian Universalist congregation. And folks can bring lots of different theologies into the conversation. We recognize that, that some, folks, some of us are going to be deeply theistic. Some of us are deeply Christian. Some of us are Jewish. Some of us may be really drawn to Buddhism, for example, or earth-centered traditions, pagan traditions, Native American traditions. And we recognize we can hold all of those conversations together and help each other figure out where do we need to follow for the personal spiritual path. Because we're, we're pretty eclectic. We are simply eclectic and, if I say, omnivorous in that sense. We are pluralistic in that we can hold that so many different practices can all be together in the moment. My Facebook memories were showing me, reminding me how much a year ago, many of us were just kind of recovering. I think recovering, returning, and recovering from the Parliament of World Religion, right? Where you had people from truly from around the world and from a wide range of faiths all be present with one another. 
and say we are willing to be with each other because we know it's better to have this variety, that we are better for diversity than when we simply stick to one path. And I'll stop there for that one. I'm sure the conversation will continue. All right. Keep track of the ones that I've offered to you. Oh, I love, okay, we have three questions on one page and they're all different. So I'm gonna just tackle them the best I can. Do you like milkweeds? Yes. Unabashedly, milkweeds are fabulous. Can I just say how much I am grateful for all the care and effort over years of the grounds around the congregation, of the commitment to having as much of a native and wildflower environment around the congregation as possible, this is a beautiful moment to look at the diversity of the natural surroundings right now, including milkweeds. Let's see. Do I know more about the stained glass than it came from the original U Church, the previous congregation building? Do I know more? Off the top of my head, I will confess no. The website says good things. We have more folks who can talk about the stained glass with more uh, information um, present than I can. I apologize. That is a gap. I will do better. But I love the stained glass. This is a piece. Um, so in case you don't know, the congregation was previously at building downtown. It had a lot of the same kind of uh, the, the architecture for this building picked up a lot of the same kind of spirit of the architecture of the previous building. Um, unfortunately, that building. It was landlocked and it simply couldn't be adapted to be more accessible, to have something called, you know, air conditioning, things like that. I know <laughs> we would have really had a challenge there. Um, so we had to give up that building and come into and really choose to be in this space. And this is, was a beautiful choice, in my opinion. And part of the wonder was that we got to bring all the stained glass. That was a gift. So I want to invite folks to really just enjoy and be present to it. It is a kind of a rare treat to have such beauty among us and the result of very good stewardship, might I say. And this one in particular was one that was not actually seen by the congregation in, on Sunday morning all that much because it was behind the choir. So what a fabulous choice. Thank you, Colin, for kind of zooming out here. What a fabulous choice for placing this stained glass with the lilies and so on, the lilies of the field, right? Uh, front and center so that we may all enjoy it all the time. It was a good opportunity. All right. And the third question on this one is Spider-Man or Batman? I know. This might be the tough one. Spider-Man or Batman? Uh, do I have to choose? I mean, you know, we, we kind of are beyond binaries, aren't we? I mean, um, Spider-Man or Batman. I, I will, I will declare Spider-Man in, the, uh, there we go. Thank you. In this moment, the smart alecky web slinger. I think I had more, I could relate to that one. The one that was like the groovy 70s animated version. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web any size, catches thieves just like flies. Look out, here comes Spider-Man. All right. I mean, it also was a joy to start to introduce my children to the Adam West Batman when they were toddlers. So, I mean, we go for it all. We're watching Batman in our house right now, actually. <laughs> the new animated one. The new animated one on Amazon. I'm just going to say it's great. Let's see. Let's see. I'm going to go for this one, which is also simply a joy. Um, the question is, how will you celebrate your anniversary of ministry? And I think 
I think that the person is asking, um, in part of how uh, we recognize um, years in ministry is the years by, after which one has been ordained into ministry. In my case, I was ordained into ministry by the congregation in which I grew up and I still have membership in, which is the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Worcester, Massachusetts. And, and in March, on March 19th, in fact, it will be the anniversary of this. It will be 25 years. How did that happen? 25 years in ministry, and actually another two if you count when I started being on staff in congregations. And how will I celebrate? That's a good question. A little bit stay tuned. But also in Unitarian Versalism at our annual gathering at, uh, called General Assembly, the ministers gather, and we have one of our services is dedicated to what we call the 2550 recognizing those who've been in ministry 25 years and those who've been in ministry for 50 years. And that will be in Baltimore next year, and my family and I will be traveling to that, and I really look forward to the chance to do that in person. I've been watching those ministers, my colleagues, celebrate since I was a student, and it's just such, it's such a gift to be able to do that with the peers as well. I tell you, I'm on the 50-year plan, in case anybody wonders. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled with 25. I am on it, but I'm on the 50-year plan. Thank you. I have no idea what's going to come. I mean, I didn't know I was training to, for a pandemic either. So here we are, right? Whew. I tell you, my undergrad actually helped with the pandemic. That was wild. My undergraduate is in theater, technical theater, so just so you know. Uh, let's see. I do want... I do want to offer this one. What are your thoughts about how we can support one another in the community regardless of the results of November's election? I do. You all don't go small, do you? We go big, which is good. I mean, I, I would have been surprised if I hadn't seen the election question, frankly. Um, well, for one thing, as we've been looking at the worship schedule, I will be in the pulpit on the Sunday before the election, the Sunday after the election. I will come up with titles, one before and one after, but I will also say, Something might change. I might need to be flexible to see what the actual response and need is. What I will also offer is that for those of us, and I will speak to, I'm speaking to issues because I can speak to issues, right? We are within a tradition that embraces democratic process, every voice, every vote. We are a tradition that embraces individual freedom. And we also understand how we are all in this together. We need one another desperately. And we, so we operate from that. And we also operate from an understanding that we care for our earth. And we also recognize that we have to work on this every day. There is no assumptions of one way or another. The path demands that we are in it and that we do not assume that things are going to resolve, that we do not assume anyone direction. We do not defeat ourselves ahead of time by assuming a negative outcome, and we do not just let it ride. Was it 72 days? Right? Yeah, 
72 days. We're on it. And we are all on it. And after the results, I think after certain results, we mobilize and deepen in community. And after certain results, we also mobilize and deepen in community. Because our leaders, whoever they are, will need to also continue to be challenged by us as they should always be. We should always keep asking our questions of them as well. And depending on what happens, we'll be spending maybe some, maybe some moments with a lot of candles either way, because we're going to need just to take a breath and maybe have some ice cream. And then we go forward. That might be my food. <laughs> you might have something you want. I want to start to wrap things up. And I think this question, I think, always comes up in some ways, too, and I want to bring this out. How can we bring more black and brown participants into our community? How can we bring more black and brown participants into our community? I appreciate that question every time. Because one of the first things we also need to understand and keep practicing and deepening on is recognizing how much this congregation, this tradition of which we are a part, has long benefited from a uh, you know, white supremacy system. This is simply the case. And part of our work is to keep exploring and understanding the impact of racism, the impact of uh, cultural bias, the impact of colonization, uh, colonialism. You know, I was just in Hawaii a few weeks ago for the first time, and wow. The number of Christian churches, Christian organizations, schools, and so on is just phenomenal. And it's there because of the, the, the assumption that they needed to be converted to the white folks' religion. It's a part of the history and culture and present today. And so our effort is to keep doing our own work as well. So for me, the question is actually not that question, but simply how do we actually show up in our community? Because the best way we're going to be, the way to be actually racially diverse, culturally diverse, range, to have the range, is to simply keep living into the values that we say we profess around anti-racism, anti-oppression, multiculturalism. And then we can see what happens. And we can also simply be good partners as well. And that is a precious, precious service into the world. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Rousseau said, humans are inherently good. Hobbes said, we are inherently evil. Unitarian Universalist believes, teaches, we are a mixed bag. We are fully human. We are flawed and we are fabulous and everything in between. We have, I'm going to go back to Carl Sagan and contact here. There's the, there's the sci-fi reference. The aliens talking with Ellie. Arroway, the scientist, going out into the universe with the wormholes that were created in that story to say that we are capable of such beauty and such horror. And what the aliens remind us is that what they have totally just found is true across all space and time is how precious life is. And so we are called, I think, we are called to recognize that we are fully human, 
and fully capable and do create hell on earth. And that we have great capacity and should be living into joy as well. We are never going to be perfect. That's not the point. But we can learn. We can become wise from when we screw up. And when we apologize, we can learn as well. When we can own how we have made mistakes. And when we can say to another, you have hurt me. That also is part of the learning as well. It is an ongoing process in our human project. And I look forward to continuing on that project together. So in that spirit, thank you for all of the questions. I never know what's going to show up. I never quite know. And it's always a gift. And thank you for your trust that I might actually put something together as well. And I'm happy to talk further on any one of them or hear more. And I'm also up for letting these questions shape our year to come. So I invite you us to close with our hymn number 346, Come Sing a Song with Me. I invite you to rise in body or spirit. The chalice is now extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and hearts and souls of each of one of you. Carry that flame with you as you leave this place and share it with those you know, with those you love, and most especially with those you have yet to meet. Our time for questions has ended, and yet our search has only just begun. May we go forth from this place in the spirit of wonder, knowing that as we bring forth the light of truth out into the world, we too will always need more room for light to come in. So let us rejoice that we may make space in a community such as this 
in a company with the ever-present mystery of life. Our worship is ended. Let our spirit, let our service begin. <laughs> 